Alrighty, let's go ahead and get started. Hello everyone, and welcome to today's stream. This is the sixth day in our in-depth tutorial series on the C programming language. And how's everyone doing? I see we've got uh, some people in the chat. Blue Jay, Casino, thanks. Welcome, welcome. Hope that everyone is having a good day so far. It's the weekend, finally. We've made it to the weekend. Um, and I do feel slightly bad about making, or at least asking people to uh, show up for what is ultimately kind of an academic lesson on a weekend, uh, which is why we're going to try and keep today a little bit shorter than the past few days. It's going to be a relatively short lesson. We're going to talk about some additional features of C that we haven't quite covered yet, um, and discuss how floating point numbers work, which is one of those things that, you know, a lot of people are kind of subconsciously aware of that floating point is weird. Uh, you know, you add point 0.2 and point 0.1 and you get like point 0.3 and then like 50 zeros and then a 4. And you're like, well, why does that happen? Uh, we shall discuss that today. So yeah, let's go ahead and just kind of jump right into things with our first topic of the day, which is going to be the last type in C that we haven't yet discussed. And that type is what we call a union, a union type. And so let's just go ahead and start off the day with an example of a union type. <laughs> Blue Jay, it's like the neighbor's kid. We all know it's weird, but we don't pay it much attention. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is, that is kind of how a lot of people feel about uh, floating point, especially, you know, if you are a systems programmer like me, you probably don't work with them very frequently. At least I don't. Uh, usually if I need an integer, or if I need a non-integral type, it's fixed point. So yeah, floats are, floats are definitely weird, but there's something that we encounter, so we're going to go ahead and talk about the internal mechanics. But yeah, first let's just start with something nice and simple for the day, which is unions. So let's go ahead and make a new program here. It's a very simple C program, we'll just call it unions.c. Awesome, we'll go ahead and make sure so that we can build this. Alright, add it to our CMake lists. All right, great, we're in business. So, let's go ahead and start off our program. We're gonna start it in exactly the same way as we've started off every other program, meaning I'm gonna include some standard headers here that we're going to want, scdio and scdlib. We've got our main function that's gonna return exit success to indicate that our program exited correctly. And now we're gonna go ahead and talk about unions. So, structs in C, so let's say when we wrote a struct, you know, we, well, we have to give it a name, so let's just call it some struct. When we wrote a struct in C, um, we listed a number of data members inside of that struct. And so let's say that this struct is going to contain an integer uh, and a float. So yeah, so we've got a struct here that contains an integer and a float. And we discussed how values are laid out in memory within structs, meaning that, you know, we have to consider um, data alignment as we lay them out, but our data are laid out sequentially. And so, if we were to go ahead and print the size of this struct, then we would see that it's going to be the size that we would expect, meaning that um, it's going to have, well, four bytes for our int plus four bytes for our, for our float means that we're going to have eight bytes sequentially. And, you know, if we add another type to this, let's say that, you know, we went ahead and we added a double to this, so we can say, you know, double, double val. Then we would need to add eight more to that, and the size of our struct would become 16. So yeah, so structs in memory are data were laid out next to each other, side by side. If we say we have a double and then an int and then a float, then they're going to be laid out right next to each other, you know, give or take for alignment, but there's no alignment issues with this struct because of the way we've written it. Um, and yeah, that's how we manage memory in structs. And we talked about that, you know, this is actually a really, really nice property of C structs that the data are laid out sequentially in memory and that there are fixed rules that govern how that alignment works. It means that if we are writing a C program, we have the full capability to compute how much memory 
our structures are going to use, which is fantastic. And so today we're going to talk about what happens if we don't want these values to be sequential. And so I'm just going to start off by getting rid of our double here, and I'm going to change this keyword struct to the keyword union. And you'll note here that when we do that, yeah, we need to cascade this keyword union all the way down. So unions are like structs in that they're a special type in C that we have to proceed with the kind of classification of the type. So since some struct is a union, and actually that's now kind of a misnomer, it's no longer a struct, it's now a union. So I'll just go ahead and give it a better name. We'll just call this some union. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Okay. It's okay, our refactoring tools are a little bit uh, wonky today, that's fine. There we go, so now we're going to write union some union. We've got to prefix it with union, just like we did with structs. And let's run this and see what happens. Oh. Huh. That's interesting. The size of our of our structure here, of our type, has become four. Huh, that's a little odd. Okay, eh, that's fine. Well, what happens if we add a double? Let's what happens if we add double back? Double val back. Surely that will change things. And it does, but not necessarily in the way that we would expect. So, what's going on here with this union? So, what's happening with our union here um, is that in a union, Prince Logic, it's not that it's compressed, right? We talked about compression, we talked about how we can pack structs to make sure that the data are laid out right next to each other in memory with no padding. What happens with a union is that our fields overlap. And so this integer value and this float value actually occupy the same space in memory. And so if I go back and I just go ahead and redefine our struct as well, so let's redefine our struct. And now I'm going to make one of both of these. So I'll say struct some struct s union some union u. And now what I want to do is I just want to print the pointer offsets of the fields in these types. And so we're going to go ahead and say, okay, so printf uh, for the struct. Our int val was at this offset. And our float was at another offset. And obviously we'll just take the address of s.int val and s.floatval to pass into this printf here. Remembering, of course, that we need a new line. And then we'll do the same thing for our union. And we'll pad that out. And so now if we run this program here that's going to print out the offsets of the fields in both our struct and then our union, then we'll see that for the struct, the fields have sequential or sequential addresses in memory, just as we specified them. The int begins at some pointer, begins at some address, and then the float comes next four bytes later, which of course reflects the size of int and the fact that float has to be padded to a four byte boundary. Union, on the other hand, if we go ahead and we look at this type, looks a little bit different. I mean, obviously, you know, the absolute address is the same, but if we look at the offsets of both the int and the float, then those offsets are exactly the same, showing that these values are not sequential in memory, they overlap. And I could even change float val in our union to something that's another type completely, a double. And you'll see that, hey, the addresses are still the same. So in other words, our data still fully overlap. They start at the same address. And so yeah, so that's a union. It's a collection of fields that occupy overlapping spaces in memory. Uh, hey Bradley, how are you in the chat? Welcome, welcome. Uh, so yeah, so that is the very kind of basic concept behind unions. And this is a very simple representation of a union. 
And this union, honestly, isn't even that useful. It's not incredibly frequent that we may want to, you know, have the same location and memory for both an int and a float. But let's talk about a case that might be a little bit more useful. Oh, well, thank you, Bradley. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, glad that I'm, yeah, definitely glad to be able to help people here, however I can, uh, with, yeah, learning C. So yeah, so let's talk about a much more useful use of a union. Now, what we're going to do here is I'm going to emulate a register on the x86 architecture. So on x86, registers are able to... Um, registers are able to occupy, um, no, well, they're not able to occupy, sorry. Registers are able to, um, be subdivided into lots of different sizes. So yeah, so registers can occupy all kinds of different sizes. And so on the x86 architecture, most of our registers, oh, right, and I need to rename this something different, because register is actually a rarely used C keyword. And I'm going to go ahead and include my std int types for this program as well. So every register, other than, you know, some very special registers that are used for what we call SSE. Um, okay, Bradley, you can, you can just go. I'm not going to entertain that. Just head out. Anyway, so on x86, our registers are 64 bits long. Um, and so this will be, you know, our, uh, our, what we call quad word value for this register. And so yeah, all of our registers are 64 bits long. If you look at an x86 processor, then you'll see we have lots of, um, we have lots of different, um, <laughs> apologies, we're getting a bit tired today. Uh, lots of different registers, uh, and you'll see that some of them, there's this kind of naming convention that our long word, our quad word, 64-bit registers all begin with an R. And so if you look at a diagram of an x86-64 CPU, then you'll see that we have register names like RAX, RDX, uh, RSP, RSI, etc. Uh, no, I, I don't think anyone's actually laughing at that story. That's kind of horrific. And actually, let me take one second here. Let's make sure the audio doesn't get messed up here. Let's see here. Give me one second, guys. Apologies. Okay, there we go. All right, that is an overall improvement to the quality of the stream. Okay. So, yeah, there we go. So we've got our 64-bit registers, our quad word registers, each of which begins with um, an R. However, these registers can be subdivided. So these registers can be subdivided into different parts. So for example, we may have, we may want to subdivide the 64-bit register into two 32-bit registers. And so the way that we can represent that is by putting a struct inside of our union. And inside of this struct, we can embed our high D word and our low D word. And so what these are is it's just the first 32 bits and second 32 bits of our 64-bit integer. And remember, because these registers overlap, or because these fields overlap in memory, if we access or assign to any of these fields, it will change the values in all of the rest. So if I assign a new value to my quad word field, the values of high and low may be liable to change as well. And now you can do this using a struct. That can actually be pretty useful sometimes. But oftentimes, people who are working with registers uh, in software, meaning largely people who do things like writing emulators, will actually just make these arrays instead. And so this will be a uint 32 t d word, and I'm going to make it an array of length 2. 
And just for our fun fact, on x86, our D word registers, our double word registers, reflect the lower half of our quad word registers. And so, for example, the double word counterparts of the quad word registers that we listed below would be EAX, EDX, ESP, and ESI. However, believe it or not, we've also got more different subdivisions that we can make. We can divide our registers into 16-bit quantities. And we'll have four of those to make up our quad word. These, of course, being the register names like um, AX, DX, SP, and SI. And then below this even, we have even more registers. And so, we can actually even subdivide these guys here into bytes. And in x86, the individual bytes of our word registers are addressable. And so to divide these guys into bytes, I'm actually not going to make an array. I'm going to define an anonymous struct containing my high byte and my low byte. And we'll just call these bytes. And there will be four of these guys, which have names on x86 like AH, AL, DH, DL, etc. And so this is a union representation of one of the registers, one of the little bits of memory that's on the CPU die that's on an x86 CPU, a lot like the ones that, you know, we've probably got in most of our machines that we're watching this on today. And so now let's see how we can use this register type. So let's say that I'm going to make a register, and I'll just give it a name like RIX. I'll just give it, um, yeah, I'll just give it a name like that, RIX. Perfect. That's the name of one of our x86 registers. It's called the accumulator. It's the one um, that's used to indicate return values for subroutine calls, which we'll talk about when we get to assembly, but just a little bit of trivia. Now, if we want to actually use this union for things, as we saw earlier, we can access its fields using the dot operator, right? And so if I want to print out, you know, the value of RAX, then I can, of course, do that. Let's see here. This is going to be a long unsigned int. Oh, right. And I actually need to prefix that. There we go. We can also print out the D words, though. So I can say EAX high and then EAX low. And then we'll just print our values and see what happens. So we're going to say that this is going to be RAX.QWORD, RAX.DWORD uh, 0, and RAX.DWORD 1. Okay, awesome. So there we go. So you can see here that we can access the fields of unions in just the same way as we access the fields of structs. And the only difference is that for a struct, these fields were sequential in memory, and for a union, they overlap. So let's say that I'm going to assign some value to RIX. Let's say that I'm going to assign the value uh, our favorite hexadecimal number, not x, um, dead beef, cafe zero 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 i don't know there we go some quad word value some 64-bit value now if we run our program then you'll see that of course when we print our quad word the value of rax was set to that quantity and we'll go ahead and print these in hex just to make it easier for us to read so we can see here that yeah our RAX was indeed set, as we were expecting it to have been. Our quad word. However, our double words also had their values set when we assigned the quad word value. Right? And so we set quad word to this value, and then we ended up getting values not only in quad word, but also in our double word fields. 
And if we reassign this value and do the same thing again, so let's say that I'm just going to assign this to uh, the hexadecimal number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. That's all of our hexadecimal digits. And I run this again. Then you'll see that again, the double word values have changed along with the quad word. Uh, Cyber Yami in the chat, how many of these lectures will there be? Uh, not too many more. Uh, not too many more C lectures. We're probably going to do at least two more. Uh, there are a few more topics that I want to cover uh, that have to do actually with things like a little bit of the C compiler internals, um, using C build tools, stuff like that. Oh, you need to catch up. Yeah, the, the previous lectures um, are all available on as VODs on this channel, uh, and then I also have a YouTube channel that I've been posting them to that you can access as well. And so Blue Jay, yeah, you've got a question in the chat. So the double words sequentially overlap on top of the quad word, and that's exactly correct. Because we defined this quad word as an eight byte quantity, right? A 64 bit quantity. And then we said that in the same union with that quad word, we were going to have an array of two double words, of two 32-bit integers. And so, yeah, and so that's kind of, that's, yeah, exactly. The, this array is laid out sequentially in memory, like any other C array. And so, yeah, so these sequential accesses of this array return subsequent 32-bit quantities. Our 64-bit quantity, though, of course, is a little bit special. Um, it's not subdivided. But, of course, we can actually assign any of these fields, and it will change all of the others. And so if I were to actually assign rax dot, let's say, dword0 to not x beef cafe, our favorite hex word. Oh, and then we, of course, remember to actually print the output, because that is important. So we're going to go ahead and print our output. Actually, let me change this so that all the output lines up. Then you'll see that even though we only assigned the double word, right? So even though we only assigned the double word, we've changed the value of our entire number. And so that's how unions work. When we assign one field, all of the others change. And now I do have to note here Oh, uh, Cyber Yemi, a hex word is, it, it's just a word that we spell using hexadecimal digits. There's nothing, like, fancy that has to do about it. They're just special hexadecimal numbers that look like words. That's it. That only use the letters A through F. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not a C concept. It's a, uh, it's just like a kind of CS, uh, in-joke. And then, uh, Raquel Laura, how are the high and low determined? Yeah, that's a great question. So the high and low values here are determined by accessing subsequent 32-bit quantities within this array of double words that we defined inside of our union. And so again, because this array and this quad word overlap in memory because we declared them as a union, when we assign one of these values, when we assign one of the fields, because we're changing a certain position in memory and all of these overlap, we're actually changing all of the other fields values as well. Because again, each one of these fields is just a different interpretation of a region in memory, right? And so each one of these fields, it's all the same region in memory and each one just interprets the data a little bit differently. This field interprets it as a single 64-bit integer. This field interprets it as two 32-bit integers. This field interprets it as four 16-bit integers, and so on. And so yeah, that's how we're getting the high and low. It's just from examining those regions in memory. And it might actually uh, be a little bit helpful to get a drawing here. So give me one second to get a uh, drawing set up going, and then we can go ahead and discuss that. So give me one second to get a projection going. Let's see here. Wasn't thinking that we would do this until later today, but now realizing that it could be very helpful. Let me go ahead and get that pulled up. 
Uh, so Cyber Yemi, while we're getting this set up, so a single cell in the D word array is just the first or last 32 bits of the quad word. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because the array and the quad word overlap in memory, right, the first 32 bits of the array is the first 32 bits of the quad word. And the second 32 bits of this array are the second 32 bits or of the 64-bit quantity. And so, yeah, and so because they overlap, we just have to access those different positions in memory by doing a dereference, and we can access the values. So, yeah, so here's a question. So, this is really cool, but what does this actually help us with? Well, some C programmers may never actually need to use unions. It might not be something that you need. However, there are certain pieces of software that we can write that become substantially easier to write with the use of unions. Um, one of those is if you are trying to write a simulator for an instruction set architecture. Right here we've modeled the registers in an x86 system, and so if I were writing an emulator for an x86 processor, then I could use this definition to access all of the different subdivisions of registers that the architecture supports without having to take up a bunch more fields to do that or write code to explicitly convert between them. I could just dump everything in an x86 register union and that would be that, and then that would be my register handling finished. You can also use unions to inspect data types. To inspect data types, maybe convert between them, inspect the binary sequences of them, and that's actually the real reason that we're covering unions today, is that we're about to look at how floating point values are represented um, computationally, and in order to observe that, we're really going to want to know how unions work first, because we're going to want to convert our floats to integers. And again, we're going to do that in just a little bit, so you'll see that. Um, so yeah, for now we can just file this away as kind of a cool trick, but we are actually going to use it in just a little bit. And so yeah, so let's switch over to our projection really quick, and let me just draw out the diagram of what this union looks like in memory. And so our topic for right now is unions. Which, uh, I seem to have a habit of trying to write union as onion, I don't really know why, um, but if I ever accidentally write onion, someone in the chat can call me out. Like, it's, it's a weirdly frequent error that I make. I have no clue why. But anyway, so in this union, let's start off with the simplest field possible. Are you at 64t? Keyword. So let's go ahead and draw out this quad word. And so the layout of this quad word is going to be as follows. We're just simply going to have from offset 0 to offset 64. This entire thing is just going to be occupied by keyword, by our u and 64 sub t. <laughs> when you haven't had lunch yet. Yeah, I actually haven't, so that might be pertinent. <laughs> Blue Jay's smash mouth intensifies. Yeah, we, we could play the song from Shrek, but I don't want to get DMCA'd. Um, okay, so next we're going to move on to our u at 32 sub t array. That we call D word. And our D word array was two elements long. So we'll go ahead and write that in there. And let's draw out now what this array looks like. So, as we said, it's going to occupy... Ah, uh, that's not what I wanted to do. It's going to occupy the same region in memory as our quad word. Let's get that aligned a little better. There we go. But it's going to be subdivided. And so this field here is, again, occupying the same memory region, but in the middle, at byte 32... It's divided into D word sub one, or sorry, D word sub zero, and D word sub one.
And so you can see how when we assign to d word sub zero or d one d word sub one, we're also technically assigning part of q word because again, these values overlap in memory. So when we assign down here, it's going to get passed up to all of the other fields as well, because it's just the same region in memory. All right, and let's go ahead and we'll just complete our diagram here. We'll draw out our uint16 array. And this is just our array of words. We've got four of those guys. Go ahead and draw a rectangle for them. Okay, we've got another uh, question in the chat from CyberYami. Why do we use a hex number instead of a regular base 10 number? So the reason that I'm using a hex number is that, remember that in hex, every digit converts to exactly four bytes. Every digit, or sorry, four bits. Every digit reflects exactly four bits in the binary string that our integer really is under the hood. And so by using hex values, we can see that they'll be subdivided when we try and access subsequent fields, which just makes it a little bit easier um, to, to see how the union is working, right? We can see very clearly that if we have dead beef cafe, blah, 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 then we can see where it splits on byte boundaries. Versus if I were to use base 10, it would be basically random looking, and that honestly wouldn't really be very helpful for us. And so yeah, so that's why we're using hex. So anyway, here's our word. Our word, again, is now going to be split even further. So we're going to have word sub zero, word sub one, word sub two, and so on. And just to make sure that this concept is really, really, really clear, when we assign to our D word again, so let's say we assign D word at zero, we're not only assigning into this quad word, but because our words also occupy the same region in memory, we're actually assigning some new values to them as well. And so yeah, so that is unions. We've got an overlapping region in memory in which we can place, or in which we can subdivide different values in different ways. And so yeah, and that's why we like unions. They're very useful for getting different representations of the same underlying region of memory. Um, and just for to answer the question as well of like, what are some extra uses of these things? Like where, you know, the kind of the perennial question of where do I use this in the real world, teacher? Um, C programmers oftentimes will also use this idiom called um, tagged unions, which means that we actually can have a form of polymorphism by uh, writing a union that contains a tag, which is usually some type of enum, um, and then we can also have the actual values. So let's say we wanted a tagged enum that, or a tagged value that can represent both an int or a float, then that value would contain, you know, enum type, and then a union containing both an int and a float, and we could use the tag to determine which union field we want to access. Uh, Raquel Laura, if d word sub zero and d word sub one are different values, how do we know what keyword will be? Well, right, so d word sub zero and d word sub one occupy the exact same region of memory as keyword. And so if you want to determine what keyword's value is, then you would just reinterpret this 64-bit sequence as a 64-bit integer, and then you would get your keyword. So in other words, these two really just combine to make up our quad word value. And because they occupy the same region of memory, if we assign to one, then we're actually assigning to all of the fields at once. Makes sense. Okay, good. Glad we were able to clarify that. Awesome. And now I do have to note here, before we move on, that technically what we're doing in this little sample program is we're actually making use of some undefined behavior. 
In the C standard, it's actually undefined what happens if you assign one union field and then access another. And so by assigning D word, then accessing Q word, we're actually exploiting some undefined behavior in our compiler. But I will note that I've never seen a C compiler that doesn't do this. Um, so it's basically a standard behavior. And so we can actually rely on this undefined behavior in order to write programs like the one we have here. All right, so the next thing that we're going to do now is let's move on to discussing our next topic. And this is a pretty difficult concept purely because I think there is math involved. Um, and also because it's just very unintuitive. It really is a pretty unintuitive concept. And so what we're going to talk about now is how floating point actually works. Like when you write float or double and you, you know, you add these values together, what actually happens under the hood? It's, it's not something that lots of people think about, but it is something that's important for us to know as systems programmers. We want to know exactly what our data types look like underneath the veil of, abst of abstraction that C provides. And so let's go ahead and begin discussing floating points. And to do that, I'm going to write another union. And so I'm going to write this union called floating point. And this union is going to be extremely, extremely, extremely simple. It's only going to contain two values. It's going to contain an integer that I'm going to call iVal and a float that I'm going to call fval. And that's it. So remembering, of course, that int and float have the same size. Both of these are four byte quantities or 32 bit quantities. When we assign to one of these fields, we will assign to both of them. And so we are now going to use this union to inspect our floating point value and see if we can determine exactly how our floating point value is working. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a floating point union. So I'm going to say union floating point FP. And I'm going to assign FVAL to just some floating point value. Let's say I'm going to find it to like uh, 47 point, uh, I don't know, 625, something like that. 47.625. And you'll notice that we get a warning and we're going to ignore that. If you want to specify that this is specifically a float instead of a double, we can append an F to it. And now what I want to do is I want to print the integer value that is stored inside of our union. And so here we've assigned a floating point value and we're going to print an integer value. Okay, that's fairly straightforward. Let's see what happens. Well, that's not very intuitive. Right? That's that's really not very intuitive at all. I mean, 47.625 we know is not this giant number in hex. So, this gives us, and I mean, we can even print this number in decimal, so it's just a little bit easier to see that, you know, this is definitely not the same value, right? This value has no relation to this value. And so, okay, so if we're just doing forensic analysis and trying to figure out, well, how on earth do floats work? We know that they work differently from integers, right? We know that their internal representation is going to be pretty different from that of ints because, well, we tried to overlap them and see if there's any correlation, and boy, is there not. So yeah, how do floats actually work? is the question. So let's talk about that. And this is one of these concepts that we're actually going to do a lot of drawing for. And just an advance warning, there is some math here. Um, so I know that I know that lots of software engineers don't like when a whole bunch of math comes in and it's not very difficult math. It is just arithmetic, but it's a type of arithmetic that you might not have done in a while. So just an advance warning, I'm going to do my best to walk you through it as slowly as we can. But if anyone gets confused, please let me know in the chat and I'll be more than happy to slow down or explain what we're doing. So yeah, let's talk about floating point. Floating point values on your computer and basically every other computer that is nowadays in common use are represented 
according to a standard that is called IEEE. So IEEE 754. This is IEEE 754 floating point. IEEE is an organization that standardizes lots of things in the computing field. They do standards for electrical engineering and kind of by extension, they also do some standards for software. And so yeah, so the standard that we refer to as IEEE 754 dictates how floating point works. It's defined in a big standards document that you can uh, buy from ISO. Yes, they actually charge you money for this. And because I'm just that crazy, Here's what it looks like. Here's the document. This is all I can show of it, or they'll sue me for copyright. But yeah, there's the document, IEEE standard for floating point arithmetic. Uh, revision 2008, because I didn't really want to get the newer one. But yeah, so that's how, that's kind of, there's a standard for this. There are very, very strongly dictated rules as to how floating point works that make sure that it works the same across different platforms. Prince, how much does it cost? It's a hundred dollars. <laughs> It's a hundred bucks for a 70 page PDF. So yeah, thanks to IEEE ISO for, for that. Um, really cool. So anyway, let's talk about how floating point works. So let us first begin. Yeah, I know. I know it's expensive. It's, it's priced for institutions to buy it. Um, but oh, well, it's fine. Anyway, so let's talk about IEEE 754 floating point. Now, IEEE 754 is not very easy to convert to. Converting from an integer or from, well, a, a string representation to IEEE 754 is still kind of an active problem. There are still people who are trying to make that process run faster of converting from strings to floating point values in memory. It's actually really hard to do. It's very challenging to actually do that process. Um, there's a lot of weird math involved and stuff like that. But today, we're going to skip the string part and just assume that we have kind of a numeric representation. And so let's actually take the value that we were playing with earlier, 47.625. 47.625. And let's convert this to floating point. In other words, let's figure out what the underlying binary representation of this number is. And by the way, we are going to consider this to be a 32-bit float. So this is 47.625F, meaning 32-bit, or what we call single precision float. It's a single precision. All right, so internally in memory, a floating point number looks like this. So in our floating point number, we have a fairly large number of fields. So this is a 32-bit large field, zero to 32. Oh, uh, Cyber Yami asked you a question. Is there ever more than one precision? There is. Yeah, there actually is. There's also double precision, and that's why we use the double keyword in C to represent a 64-bit float. But yeah, because it's easier and because double precision is really just bigger single precision, we're going to focus on single precision for right now. It's also easier to convert to by hand just because there's less. Uh, there's it's, it's smaller, right? It's smaller, easier to work with. And so within an IEEE 754 floating point number, the first thing that we get is a one byte long value. Let me draw our little thing better here. It's a one byte long value called the sign bit. So this is the sign bit. And the sign bit works like this. If the sign bit is zero, then we have a positive number. So if the sign bit is zero, then we have a positive number. Or is that right? 
Oh, I'm now doubting myself. I reviewed this right beforehand today, but uh, anyway. Okay, right, so yeah, so the sine bit is zero. We've got a positive value. And if the sine bit is one, we have a negative value. Uh, bit. Uh, yeah, so CyberYammy, this is a single bit. So this is one bit. Um, that reflects whether our number is positive or negative. Okay, great. So there's our sine bit. That's actually fairly simple, right? That's a, That part's actually easy enough. And so our sine bit here, if we're trying to convert this number, 47.625, into IEEE 754 floating point format, then we've just got to look and determine... Well, is the sign positive or is it negative? Well, since this is, you know, effectively a positive number, we didn't write a sign, but it's implicitly positive because that's how we write numbers. We know that our sign bit in this case is going to be a zero. There we go. That's not too bad, right? That really wasn't too bad at all. We've actually solved the first part of our number without really even having to do very much math. So that's really nice. The next parts are a little more tricky. So after the sign bit comes an 8-bit quantity called the exponent. And so this spans from bytes 1 to 9. It's an 8-bit quantity that we call the exponent. This is the exponent. And then the remainder of, um, and then the remainder of our value is a portion that actually goes by a number of different names. Um, you may see these names are the most commonly used. It's either called the significand or my personal favorite name the mantissa. And as we're discussing these two values, we have to discuss them together. There's really no way around the fact that these are very closely intertwined. Uh, and we've got a question for Prince Logic. Is there unsigned float? There is not. There is not an unsigned uh, floating point format in IEEE 754. You can obviously define your own floating point format that does not have a sign, but yeah, uh, IEEE 754 um, is going to use uh, a sign in every case. Alright, so let's talk about actually converting our value now, because we actually now have to consider the initial value in order to determine our exponent and our mentissa. And so the first thing that we're going to do is actually pretty straightforward. We're just going to convert our integer into binary. Or not our integer, we're going to convert our decimal value into binary. And okay, that doesn't sound too bad, right? We've actually done this in the past. We're, we're, we're used to this whole thing. We're, we're old pros at converting to binary now, so let's go ahead and do it. All right, let's convert to binary. Let's see here, how many bits am I going to want? Let's see here. So I'm going to make a simplification as I write this just to, you know, make the process go a little bit faster. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm not going to write out the entire value as a 32-bit quantity just because that would take, you know, roughly all day to do. But we can write out a large portion of it. And so this is going to be this value in base 2. Alright, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off with our integer portion, because this portion is incredibly, incredibly simple. The integer portion is literally going to work exactly the same as when we were just converting integers. And so I'm going to go ahead and write out our powers of 2. And then down below that, I'll go ahead and write out the actual values as well, like we were doing when we were first learning how to convert to binary. So, let's think about powers of 2. Let's start off with 64, which is 2 to the... 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. 2 to the 6th. Okay, so 2 to the 6th. is a value of 64. 
Now, we know that there cannot be any 64s in 47, right? Can't be any 4s, or 64s in 47. 64 is too big, and so we're going to end up having a 0 here. Next, we'll consider 2 to the 5th, which is 32. We do have a 32 in 47. And then we'll proceed down the other bits in the same way that we did prior. We've got 2 to the 4th is 16. The amount that we have left now is 15, so there's no 16s in 15. 32, 16, 0. And then we'll go ahead and write out the rest of these. 3, 2, 1, and 0, which correspond to the values 8, 4, 2, and 1. And all of these bits are going to be set. We've now got 15 remaining. And so we can just pad out the rest of this with ones. One, 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 one. And we've got a question, a good question from Raquel, from Raquel, Laura, sorry. Why did you start at 64? Uh, I started at 64 because I knew that was the power of two that was bigger than 47. And I just wanted to show the fact, just kind of very briefly review converting the binary. Um, we didn't need to start at 64. We could have started at any power of 2. I just chose 64 just to show you that we can still, you know, have leading zeros, right? That's still how our um, decimal to binary conversion is going to work. That hasn't changed. All right, now let's do the hard part. So you may have noticed that we've now handled our 47, and that's cool. But we've still got some stuff left. We've still got a 0. 0.625. Now what on earth are we going to do with that? Well, here's what we're going to do with it, and this is kind of fun. We're going to keep going. We're actually just going to keep going with our binary conversion, continuing to consider smaller and smaller powers of 2. And so, 2 to the negative first, if you remember, 2 to the negative n, or really any number to the negative n, but we're working with 2 here, is equivalent to 1 over 2 to the n. Right? Basic exponentiation, when we negate the exponent, we're indicating that we're taking the reciprocal. And so what we're going to do now is we're just going to go ahead and write out our fractions. So, 2 to the negative first, 1 half. Negative second, 1 fourth, negative 3, 1 eighth, 1 sixteenth, 1 thirty second. Oh, and I wrote those in the wrong color, but that's fine. So yeah, so we are actually just going to keep going, and we're going to keep converting until we've gotten as close to our number as we are able. So 1 fourth, 1 eighth, 1 sixteenth, 1 thirty second. All right, great. And we've got some comments in the chat that this is kind of crazy, and it is. It is. It's actually really, really crazy. We are now, yeah, we're converting things into fractional form in binary. But we'll see how this works, and it's really, really cool how IEEE 754 is going to work. And so let's go ahead and do this conversion. Now, we've got 0.625 remaining. And so what we are going to do is we are going to keep going with this, uh, with this fractional expansion of that decimal until we have no decimal left to go. And so let's go ahead and do it. So, negative 1, uh, 2 to the negative first, 1 half. We do have 1 half, or 0.5. All right, so 1 half is actually 0.5 in 0.625. So we're going to add a 1 here and make a note of how much we have left. We have 0.125 remaining to convert. Now 1 fourth, which is 0.25, is larger than 0.125. So that cannot go into our number. So we're going to note a 0. 1 eighth is 0 0.125. 
which is exactly the fractional value that we were looking for. So we're going to write a one and note that we now have no value remaining. And so as a result, we can pad out the rest of this number with zeros, zero, zero. And there we go. So that's how we can convert a fraction, how we convert a decimal value into base two. It's just the same way that we did our previous base two extension or our previous base two conversion with a conceptual expansion of just keeping going past two to the zero with and going into our negative powers of two, right? Really pretty straightforward. And so 47.625 in base two is 10111.101. And Cyber Yami again has a great question. What happens if it doesn't fit exactly? Well, what's going to happen is we are going to continue expanding our number until we run out of space. And so we're just going to keep going all the way down the chain until we run out of space to convert. And this can happen with complicated fractional values or fractional values that just do not decompose down to an even power of two. It actually happens somewhat frequently. And so as Blue Jay asked, we're going to lose some precision, right? You're going to keep writing values off the end. You're going to keep writing values, keep writing values, keep writing values, but then eventually you're going to hit a wall. And that wall is when we run out of space in our floating point value. And so what we do at that point is we stop. We're just going to, we're just going to stop. And now I will note, there is actually kind of a method that we can use to determine how we're going to truncate. And we can talk about that later, but we're not going to cover that right now because it's even more complicated. So we're just going to stick with doing our conversion for now. How do you know we run out of space? Well, these things are a fixed size, right? Like this single precision float is a 32-bit quantity. And so we know that if our value has exceeded the amount of space we have for it, then we're going to have to round off. And again, we'll, we'll talk about how, you know, how many bits each part of our number can occupy and how it's represented all of that. We'll get there, just kind of hang tight and sit back. We will get to that. So great. So now we've got our binary sequence. We've determined that 47.625 in binary is 10111.101. Awesome. So now, what do we do with this? Well, what we're going to do now is in IEEE 754 floating point, we're going to define that our number is written in scientific notation. So what that means is technically, this number right here that we've written is multiplied by a factor of 2 to the 0th. Right? In other words, it's multiplied by one. What we want to do to put this into scientific notation is we want to move our decimal point until there is a leading one in front of it. And so we're going to move this decimal point until we get to a leading one. And so let's figure out how we're going to do that. Alrighty, so... Our 2 to the 0th number, our number that is not in scientific notation, is this number. Now let's count the number of bits by which we're going to need to move our value to get into scientific notation. And so I'll note here that the red decimal point reflects... Oh, that's the wrong color. Times 2 to the 0. And the blue decimal point which we're going to move one, two, hand shook there, two, three, four, five places to place right here. So since we had to move that five bits backwards, we're going to say that this is, this number is 1.011101 times 2 to the 5th. 
right? We had to move our decimal point five bits backwards. And so we're going to say that our scale factor now is two to the fifth. And now, what happens now is that we are going to look at our exponent and use that to determine the exponent portion of our floating point number. And so how we're going to do this is we're actually going to do a very similar conversion to what we did with normal binary numbers. And so our exponent here is going to be 5, right? This 5 that we've ported over from our scientific notation. And to that 5, we're going to add 127. All right. What is the 127? Why is that there? First, let's do our arithmetic because otherwise I'll mess it up. So 5 plus 127 is 132. This 127 is a quantity that we call the bias of our exponent. And so the bias of our exponent refers to an amount that we add to our value in order to convert it to a positive number. And so what we have to do is we have to add this bias onto every exponent that we have. And the reason why is, again, all of our actual representations in IEEE 754 are unsigned, and we simply have a sign bit to reflect the sign of our number. And so we add this bias to our number so that we can accommodate both positive and negative exponents in the same 8-bit space. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty crazy. And how do we figure out what the bias should be? Well, so let's say that we define the span here from this 1 to 9 as a value called E. So for our single precision floating point, E is going to be 8, right? 8 bits. That's how big our exponent is. Our bias is going to be equal to 2 to the e minus 1 minus 1. So the bias is going to be 2 to the e minus 1 minus 1. Now, why on earth does it have this quantity? Well, the reason that it has this quantity is that, again, we want to accommodate as close as we can to an even, to, I'm sorry, to an equal number of both negative and positive exponents. So, by raising this power to e minus 1, what we're actually doing is we're adding one half of the possible range of values that we can express in our exponent to every value. And so yeah, that's how we're doing this. And so yeah, that's why our bias is the way it is. It's 2 to the number of exponent bits minus 1 minus 1. And yeah, CyberYammy says if you've got some very small number, you'll have a negative exponent. And yeah, you want to switch it over to be positive. And so what we would do is we would move our decimal point the other way, get a negative exponent, and we would add the same bias to it in order to get a positive number to write in our exponent. You thought it was E from calculus. Oh yeah, that's actually probably not very good notation on my part. Let me actually give that a different variable name so that we don't confuse anyone. That's actually a good point. Uh, let's say that I'm going to call it, we'll call this X for exponent. There we go. Okay. All good. Yeah, no, there, the, the uh, Euclid's number does not appear in all of this, uh, very thankfully. You can write it as a float, but we're not going to. So anyway, so now that we've got our exponent, we are now ready to put it in our floating point number. Oh, Blue Jay, why did we move the decimal place five times to get to two to the five? Well, we did that because we want to write our number in scientific notation. And if you remember scientific notation from a class you may have had in the past, 
scientific notation always begins with one point something. For binary or in decimal, it begins with a single digit point some value. Right? Yeah, you probably saw it in a chemistry class, or maybe you even saw it in a physics class. Most likely in chemistry. That's where I saw it, too. We used it to kind of normalize significant figures. Um, but yeah, so we just moved that over so that we could write our number in scientific notation. And that's why we did the shift. Because IEEE 754 just dictates that our number is in scientific notation. That's just how it works. So Blue Jay, so we're just moving it till we get a one in front of it. Exactly, yeah, we're moving it until there is only a single bit that is set in front of our decimal point. Exactly, and so we just always want our number to start with one point something when written in base two. Oh, it's not what I wanted, wrong tool. When written in base two. Yeah, there we go, okay, great. So now we've gotta do one more thing before we put our exponent in our number. And that is, we've got to convert it to binary again. Yay. So, we're going to convert it to unsigned binary, meaning that, of course, all of our bits, all of our powers of 2 are going to be, have a positive factor. There's no 2's complement here, which is, which is nice. And so let's go ahead and convert this. And I'm just going to do this really, really fast. All right, so 132. 128 goes into 132, so we're going to add a 1. 60, and the remainder of 132 minus 128 is 4. Oh, perfect. Super duper easy. So now we're going to add no 64s. No 16s. And I'll, I'll write this in red because we're going to copy it up. So 128, no 64s, no 32s, no 16s, no 8s, 1, 4, no 2s, no 1s. And there is at long last, our 8-bit exponent, which we're just going to copy up into our exponent bits here. And so our exponent is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And there we go. There's our exponent. Awesome. That wasn't too bad. Right? That wasn't too bad at all. It was some math, and it, there were some weird concepts in there. Like, we had a bias that we had to factor in and stuff like that. But, hey, you know, we, we can manage this. And then now the good news is, we've got a really easy part that comes after this. Which is, all we've got to do now is write the mantissa. And the mantissa is very simply everything that comes after the decimal point. So it's just this exact bit sequence, everything that comes after the decimal point is just going to be copied into our significant or our mantissa. And Raquel, for a single precision floating point, the exponent is 8 bits. Yeah, for a float, exponent is always going to be 8 bits. For a double, it's 11. Um, and there are different standards for different sizes of float, but we're just talking about single precision today because it's the easiest to work with. But yeah, so for a single precision float, the float type in C, always 8 bits. And so now, let's write our significant. Well, all we're going to do is we're just going to copy our binary sequence up into our number, right? And so we're going to have 0, and then 5 1s. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then a 0 and then a 1, and then a bunch of zeros after that. And I'm not going to write all of them. You can infer the rest. And there you go. That right there is our IEEE 754 floating point number in a nutshell. Cool, right? Pretty cool. This is how this is how numbers, this is how decimal numbers, how floating point values, decimal values, fractional values are represented at the hardware level. And we've got a comment, CyberYam, you'd have to get a pretty awful exponent to make it any bigger. I mean, well, you know, hey, sometimes we want really big numbers, and you can represent those using higher width, higher precision floating point values. Raquel Laurie, you actually like this. That's great, yeah. I think this is one of these really, really cool things that 
you know, it honestly, you could go probably your entire life as a programmer without knowing this, but I don't know. If, if I were in that position, I'd just feel like I were missing something. Like, you know, I'm sure that everyone's wondered, why does floating point round off happen, right? Why when I add point 0.2 and point 0.1, I get point 0.3 bunch of zeros random junk? Well, now you know. It's because of IEEE 754 floating point. And so, Blue Jay, we got the significant by simply copying everything. Oh, no, you're good. It's okay. It's all right. No worries. No worries. Happy to answer questions. This is really hard. Like, this is a very difficult concept. So, you know, if anyone's confused, totally feel free to ask. It's fine. This is tricky. And so, our significant is quite simply all of the bits that come after our decimal point after we have converted our number to scientific notation. Right, so we started off with the value 101111.101, blah, blah, blah. We moved our decimal place from here over five bits in order to get our scientific notation. And then we just copied all of the bits after the one into our significant. And now, why don't we include the one, right? You might be wondering, it's like, hey, why don't we include the one? Like, what, what about this one? Like, you need that, right? Well, here's the thing. When we're converting, when we are converting this value, we know that the one is implied, right? If we convert to scientific notation every time, then this value is always going to start with a one, meaning we can leave it out and get ourselves an extra bit for data for the actual value. And so, yeah, so that is why we convert to scientific notation is because it lets us save that extra bit amongst other things, but it lets us save the bit. And, you know, I think that's pretty cool. I think that's actually pretty useful. Okay, let's see here. Um... Yeah, I mean, yeah, so we had a question, yeah, Raquel Loya, or Raquel Laura, sorry, I can't talk. Uh, when do we use floating point? Well, we'll use floating point anytime we need to represent fractional values. Right, a good example would be, and no, don't use floating point for this. This is actually a bad use of floating point, but the first thing that comes to mind for people is money, right? You can buy a television that costs, you know, $625.99. And so, yeah, and so we just need to have decimal values sometimes to be able to do math with them. Currency is a bad use of floating point because of precision and you don't want round off and all of that, but it's an example of a decimal point. Or, you know, if we were considering, uh, what would be a slightly better use? Now, I work in, I work in fintech, so everything that comes to mind for me is like money. Um, but there are other uses, you know, if we, um, if we were doing some, just some math, right? We were just trying to do math. Or yeah, Cyber Yemi mentions GPA, right? If you earned, let's say that, you know, you earned four credit hours for a course, or you took a course that was three credit hours, and you got an A minus in that course. And it, your university assigns a GPA of 3.75 for an A minus. Well, then we would need to multiply these two numbers together in order to get your total number of GPA points. And so that's just an example of where we might use floating point and where actually, you know, only having a few decimal places is probably good enough. Now, I would still certainly hope that our universities are not using floating point for our GPAs. I would hope they'd be using fixed point, but hey, you never know. And so yeah, so we're just going to use these anytime we need a fractional value. And now let's see why we talked about unions today. Well, we broke this number into three components, sine bit, <clears throat> exponent, and significant. Oh, a fixed point is basically just an integer that we keep track of where a decimal point goes, right? And so we could express this number 47.625 would become 47625 times 10 to the negative three which we would write in kind of a traditional fixed point notation as 47625 f negative 3. 
that'd be fixed point. So we're actually keeping it as an integer, which avoids floating point round off, but obviously we have much more limited precision. Yeah, exactly. To avoid truncation, to avoid floating point round off, to avoid, um, yeah, just the imprecision that comes with this. Yeah, very good question. But anyway, we learned about unions now, and we could actually use a union not just to inspect the integer value of this float, but to look at the different parts of it as well. And so let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to write a struct that I'm just going to call IEEE 754. So IEEE 754. And note that I'm not giving this struct a name. I don't actually need to do that in C. Because it's a named field, I can just say, you know, floating point dot IEEE 754 dot one of this structs fields. And we don't actually need to, um, and we don't need to actually name the struct because it's not being used outside of this union. Anyway, let's go ahead and now see what happens if we copy in all of our bits or all of our components from our IEEE 754 representation. So... Let's say that we're going to have an int. I'm going to call this sign. And I'm going to specify that it has a size of one bit. So this is one more small feature of C that we haven't talked about yet. And that is that you can actually specify how the fields in a struct exactly how big they are. And so I can say that we've got a sign bit. It's one bit long by saying colon one after the declaration. Okay, so yeah, just an additional feature of structs. We can specify bit sizes. After that, I'm going to have an exponent. The exponent, of course, being eight bits long. And then I'm going to have a mantissa. That's going to be 32 minus nine bits long, which is uh, 23. 23 bytes. And yeah, we've got a question from CyberYemi that int would no longer be four bytes, and Prince Logic says you can limit the size of an int. This isn't really limiting the size of the int so much as it's just saying when you pull a single byte out of this value, cast it to an int. So in C, we can't just declare, we can't just say, you know, int x is seven bits long and it has a value of eight, right? This isn't valid syntax. You can't do this anywhere else other than inside of a struct. And another nice feature of this, by the way, is that these are automatically packed when we use a bit sequence. And so this struct, this struct declaration right here, is exactly equivalent in terms of its structural form and its binary representation to the IEEE 754 number that we wrote here. All right, so now let's go back. And let's print the different parts of our number and see if we got it right. Because, you know, there's actually a chance that we didn't. So, our sign bit is an integer. I'm going to print all of these as hex, uh, just for convenience. Our exponent. And then our mantissa. So, the sign fp.ieee754.sign the exponent fp.ie754 exponent and then the same thing for the mantissa right so we're accessing the fields of the anonymous struct that we declared inside of our union nothing too complicated it works exactly the same way as the unions we were talking about earlier and when we had those arrays it's exactly the same concept Raquel, why am I using a capital X? Just because I want them to be printed in uppercase hexadecimal. You could use a lowercase x and it would print in lowercase hex. Uh, I just prefer uppercase. I find it easier to read. Personal preference. If you want lowercase, you can write lowercase x. It's, it's all good. There, there's no real reason why you have to do one or the other. And now if we print this... Then we'll see some stuff, and that doesn't seem quite right. Did I do something wrong? I may have done something wrong here. Um, sign exponent mantissa. It's not trying to make these little endian, is it? Let's try that again. 
No, that's definitely not it. Okay. Um, hmm. What's going on with this? Okay, let's try this again. And that actually throws an error. Okay, wow. Okay. Um, hmm, interesting. Well, if we go back and we actually just print this as an int, we can just add iVal back. Then we can actually kind of see the same thing that we were looking for. I'm not going to debug that here. I'm That's just going to be a waste of everyone's time. So we're just going to go ahead and write fp.iVal. And we can break up the hex number by ourselves. It's not really that hard to do. So let's see what we've got. 423E8000. If we go back over here and we write that number, then we can just break it up into our different parts and see if it matches. So we've got 423E8000. And now we'll remember that each hexadecimal digit corresponds to four binary bits. And so we're going to convert each of these digits as if, or we're going to convert each of these digits for two bit, uh, two four bits. Convert each hexadecimal digit to four bits. Four F-O-U-R, not F-O-R, like I accidentally said it. So our four is going to be zero, one, zero, zero. Our two, zero, zero, one, zero. Three is going to be zero, zero, one, one, and let me write little markers here so I remember what we're doing. E now, E is a, a one, 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 zero, eight, one, zero, 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 and then we've got some zeros. So, let's see if it matches. All right, sign bit is zero. Check. Exponent. One, four zeros, one, two zeros. Check. That matches. Great, we're doing well so far. Let's see if we got the whole thing correct. Finally, here is our mantissa. Zero, five ones, zero, one, and then a bunch of zeros, which indeed matches the mantissa that we wrote before. So we did this conversion correctly. Boom, there we go. Great, so yeah, so we did our conversion properly. We've now successfully converted this number and we can use unions in C to verify that we did that correctly. And so yeah, that's just a nice useful feature of unions is that they allow us to get alternative representations of data that might be a little bit easier for us to work with or conceptualize of, or in this case, print. Cyber Yemi, could we print it in binary? Would it show us this? Oh yeah, you could totally print it in binary. The only issue is that printf does not actually have um, a type specifier to do binary. Uh, and so we'd have to write that conversion ourselves, and that's a little bit out of scope, but we could we could totally do it. Um, so yeah, but you, you'd have to write it yourself. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, printf includes hex and, uh, and decimal, because those are the most common bases that we really work with. Like binary we use for stuff kind of down at this level, but it's pretty infrequent that just when we're writing programs, we actually have to drop down to binary for something. Usually we can stick with just hex and decimal and that's really all we need. Okay, great. There we go, that is IEEE 754 floating point. Kind of. Not quite. There is more. Um, so there is a little bit more that comes after all of this. Uh, and Raquel, did we use the 2 to the 0 and 2 to the 5? Well, we didn't use the 2 to the 0. The 2 to the 0 was just to show us that, you know, that's where our decimal point was when we just did the raw conversion. And then the 2 to the 5, yeah, is there to show us the exponent when we moved the decimal point back 5 bits. And yeah, of course, it's represented in the binary number plus bias in the exponent. So yeah, so there you go. That's kind of how, yeah, that's how we'll work with this. 
All right. Now let's talk about a few more things. And it, this is admittedly one of the stranger things about IEEE 754. So, the numbers that we just talked about, the numbers that we just talked about are what are called normal values. And so these are normal values that we've worked with. Play synthwave music. Yes, exactly. Um, and so these are normal numbers. Normal numbers... And we'll go ahead and write this in a different color to show that it's a new vocabulary word. Normal numbers... are exactly these numbers that we see here. They're normal numbers, right? They're numbers that we write ourselves and they convert down to floating point and we can convert them back and they have arithmetic values, right? There's numbers, they're numbers that we can do math with. Very simple. And so normal is literally just, you know, a number with which we can do arithmetic. It's a number with which we can do arithmetic. If I can write today, which we've already learned I cannot, we can do arithmetic. However, these aren't the only types of numbers in IEEE 754. We actually have other types of numbers as well that we can work with. And so let's talk about what those numbers are. Okay, so these are normal numbers. We also have what we call denormalized, denormalized floating point numbers. So denormal. And these are exceptional non-arithmetic values. So they're exceptional non-arithmetic values. And what on earth does that mean? Well, it's actually relatively straightforward. In math, when we were working with, you know, probably in a calculus class, sounds like your teacher introducing the imaginaries. It's kind of similar, yeah. So in a math class, uh, probably you encounter this in a calculus class at the very latest. You'll know that there were some values that we used while we were doing calculus that weren't actual numbers. They didn't have numeric values. You may remember these guys. Infinity and negative infinity. Right? Positive and negative infinity. Okay. Great. So. How on earth does that work? Okay, so, what we are going to do is say IEEE 754 actually has a way to represent positive and negative infinity. It has a way to represent positive and negative infinity because positive and negative infinity turn out to be really useful, right? Positive and negative infinity are actually really useful values for us to have because they are the values that we get when we overflow or underflow a floating point computation. And so it's not like with integers, where if we added max value to max value, they would wrap around. Floating points don't have overflow, they have what we call trapping. And what that means is if we add the maximum possible floating point value to the maximum possible floating point value, we don't wrap around, you get infinity. And so, in IEEE 754 floating point, we've got a few different ways to represent um, these denormalized values. And to determine if a value is denormalized, we are going to depend upon the exponent and the mantissa. And we're going to make a little table out of these. So, if the exponent is all ones, so in other words, the exponent has a value of 255 in base 10, which actually I'll just, you know, let's make this easier. It's all ones. 
in base two. And the Mantissa is zero. Then the value of this denormalized number is either positive or negative infinity. And how do we determine whether the infinity is positive or negative? We look at the sign bit. Oh, Cyber Yemi, you've, you've got to leave now. Okay, that's all right. Uh, the, if you want to learn the rest of what we're doing, then the VOD will be available very shortly. You can go ahead and recap. Uh, and of course, the notes will be posted as well, so you can just read through those if you want to. But yeah, see ya. Hope that, hope that you enjoyed today's lesson. Take care. But anyway, so yeah, so if the exponent is all ones, the mantissa is zero, then the value is either positive or negative infinity depending on the sign bit. If the sign bit is zero, then it's going to be positive infinity. If the sign bit is one, it's negative infinity. Let's talk about another one. So, exponent is all ones, again. The mantissa is non-zero. Then the value that we have now is NAN, which stands for not a number. So this is not a number. Not a number. And what this means is you performed some operation that is not mathematically defined. So you may remember, again, as you were going through math classes, that oftentimes your teacher may have told you something like, and if you do this, well, there are different opinions as to what happens and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But in this class, we're going to say such and such. IEEE floating point is relatively unopinionated about such things. So for example, in IEEE floating point, Let's say you divide 0.0, .0 by 0.0. .0. So you divide by 0. Well, what's going to happen? Well, so here's what we're going to get. If we divide 0 by 0 in IEEE 754, then we are going to get not a number. And C is not going to output not a number, no. C, C does not output not a number. What it is going to do, though, is provide a function that lets us test if something is not a number. And so there's a function called isNan uh, in, I think, math.h? Uh, I want to say that's where it is. Uh, but let me, let me make sure that I'm correct. Let me look at the uh, man page. Yeah, it's called isNan, I-S-N-A-N, is not a number that we can pass a floating point value to, or a floating point variable, and it'll tell us whether or not something is not a number. And so yeah, so not a number occurs when we have done something that is undefined. Some other examples of undefined not a number values would be um, zero times infinity. In IEEE 754, we say is undefined. Um, another one is... Yeah, infinity plus infinity, we say is undefined. So basically, anytime you try and start doing math with infinities, or you divide by zero, and there are some other cases too, you're going to get a not a number. And now in IEEE 754 floating point, and you may have noticed this, and it really most floating in most languages that you've worked with, like for example, we can actually test this here. Um in my browser, if I can get it pulled up using the JavaScript console. So here we go, so let's go ahead and pull this up. And you can see right there, we've got the stream chat. Hello everyone, we've got the stream chat. Let me minimize some windows so that you can see it a little better. Perfect, okay. And let's zoom in on this. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Zoom in on this. No, zoom in on the console. There we go. And let's say that I am going to add two plus two. Now in JavaScript, which is the language that this console uses, um, all numbers are floating point. And so if I say, you know, 2.0 is equal to two, then that's true. Uh, saying that it's exactly equal in both type and value. 
And now, let's see what happens if I say 2.0 plus nan, not a number. Well, the value we get is not a number. If I do 0 divided by 0, not a number. So we see that if you try and do arithmetic with nans, any value that you work with is going to fold down to, reduce to, not a number. Same thing with dividing by zero. And so yeah, we've got zero divided by zero. And JavaScript actually provides us the same function that's in um, math.h. We've got is nan to determine whether or not something is not a number. So there you go. So that's kind of IEEE floating point. If you try and square root a negative number, that's a good question. I don't actually know what happens. Uh, I haven't tried to. Uh, so let's say we square root negative one. It's it's not a number uh, to answer Prince logic question. Yeah. So if we try and square root a negative number, we don't get a complex number. Uh, we're going to get not a number. Just because if you had to deal with complex number conversion every time you worked with floating point, um, then it would very, very, very quickly get kind of unwieldy. So yeah, so there you go. So that's what happens. So anyway, that is NAN, not a number. We've got some other denormalized values as well. So let's say that the exponent is zero. So the exponent is zero. And we have a non-zero mantissa. Then this is what we call a denormalized value. And so this is a denormalized value. Denormal value. Quite honestly, I'm not sure how you get one of these. Um, I really don't know when they would be used um well actually i mean i do know when they would be used i actually do um and so what happens with these guys if the exponent is all zeros then well it's a unicorn yeah it's kind of a unicorn um and and i briefly did forget this but now now i'm remembering very thankfully so we don't have to punt um a denormalized number is how we represent the smallest possible exponents. All right, so I mean, you're like, oh, okay, that kind of makes sense, right? Like, okay, yeah, I mean, I get that, right? So let's say that, you know, of course, of course it is. And so by default, the smallest exponent that we can have, right, is if we have, um, what is the smallest exponent we can have? Um, anyway, a denormalized number has an exponent that's one less than the smallest. We're, we don't really need to go into this because they're not things you see frequently or work with frequently. But just know that they're there. Know that they're there. This is me, unfortunately, showing my, um, maybe I need to go actually read that document. Uh, I read part of it, uh, the other night, but I didn't read the part about denormalized numbers. And I certainly can't do it on stream because I don't want to get sued by IEEE. And there you go. And it, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. So those are our denormal IEEE 754 values. They do sometimes happen. You may actually encounter these in usage. It's just, it's pretty rare. Um, and so, yeah. So if you are doing your math correctly with your floating point values, you should actually never encounter these. Really, the only reason that you're actually going to get a denormalized value is if you have made a computational error. You try to divide by zero, right, which is invalid. You've, uh, you've saturated your floating point type, and it's trapped to infinity. I would consider that to be a form of error if you were trying to get an actual value out of your computation, right? And so these values, these, these, normal val these denormal values typically just appear... Um, they typically just appear when we've made an error, plus the denormal values down here when we've got an exponent of zero for very, 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 very small numbers. But yeah, there you go. That is IEEE 754 floating point. 
And so, yeah, that's that's really about it. Um, let's go ahead and here, I'll just ask the chat, do y'all want to work through another example of how to do this conversion? Or do you think that just the one that we've got is sufficient? I'll, uh, I'll leave it up to y'all if we want to do another one. We can do another one. It's just going to require me to come up with a value that we can do by hand. Um, because I don't really want to convert all 32 bits. You, okay, Tuna says you think this was good. Yeah, sorry, you understand for one example. Okay, great. Awesome. Good. <clears throat> perfect. And yeah, okay, perfect. Everyone says that the one we've got is sufficient. Awesome. Great. Excellent. So, yeah, that's IEEE 754 floating point. This value, this uh, conversion that we did here is pretty representative of the entire thing. There are, you know, obviously, again, every once in a while, you may see a very small uh, variation of this, right? You might get a negative number, in which case you'll need to remember to set your sign bit to one. Um, but by and large, the conversion is pretty straightforward. And again, just so you know, if you have a number that is smaller than zero, you may end up with a negative exponent offset. But of course, if you add your 127, your bias to that exponent, you're still going to get a positive number. So there we go. IEEE 754 floating point. Awesome. Now, before we go today, let's talk about one more thing. And this is something that you need to know for the linked list project that I'm going to be putting out later today. So... In C, we talked yesterday about how we can actually write these kind of Java-like data structures that we're used to. All right, we can write data structures uh, like our vector that we worked with. If we can pull up the vector, right, that actually store their values. That store their values that all of the kind of state for that struct was encapsulated inside the struct itself. We also, though, discussed that, well, that can actually be a little bit limiting, right? First off, this was hard to work with. Like, this vector was undeniably kind of error-prone to write, right? It was actually kind of really error-prone to write. We made errors as we were writing it. We had to remember to multiply things and apply offsets, and the whole thing was really a little bit of a mess. And so we're going to talk about a slightly different way to write a data structure, that is going to make life really, really easy for us in C. And so the type of data structure that we are going to talk about today is what we call an intrusive data structure. So intrusive data structures. Now let's start off by just reviewing the typical linked list architecture. So technically in Java, right, so in Java, we wrote a linked list that looked something like this, where we had, um, you know, a class for our linked list. So we had a class linked list. And inside of that class, you know, we stored some things like a size. But then we had kind of this other type that we called a linked list node. That we might use to store the head and tail of our list. And this LL node type was generic. And so our linked list stored items of type E, and then our LL node, our private class LL node, stored some references. So it had a reference to LL node prev, and LL node next. But in addition, it also stored the actual data that was in the node. Right, and that's what our linked list looked like in Java. So in other words, we had a linked list. And so let's say that this is our linked list class. 
that contained a bunch of linked list nodes. So here are linked list nodes, each of which stored data. There we go, we'll draw some slightly better nodes, that's decent. And that's fine. And then of course we're gonna, you know, do our traditional linked list representation, right, that we're all used to, of having our two lines. This one has no previous. And we'll hook up our references. Anyone who's taken a data structures class recently will um, remember these diagrams with either fondness or fear. And each of these, of course, contains some data, right? So each of these contains an E. And this is our linked list. Here's head. Here's the tail. And each of these is an LL node. And this was an awesome way to write data structures in Java, right? Th this worked fantastically in Java because we had generics, right? And so we could define that our linked list is only going to contain a particular type of data. And we can actually insert that data into these linked list nodes that are instances of a private class that's defined just for that generic type. And so the linked list could fully encapsulate all of its nodes, which was, which was awesome. However, that is not the architecture that we are going to choose for our linked list in C. And the reason for that is just very plainly that writing this in C would be an abject nightmare. This would suck to try and write in C a lot because we would have to do all kinds of dynamic memory management. We would have to copy our values, not using, you know, very standard copy routines. No, no, no. We would need to copy them using this stuff again. Right? We would actually need to, every time we wanted to access things in our linked list that we had put there prior, we would need to call a get method that would manually traverse the list. But once we put the things in the list, we can't access them again until we call get, which means that our code might be a little bit slower in local scope. There are downsides to this linked list architecture. So now what we're going to do is talk about another way to write a linked list. And we're going to talk about how we write a linked list in C. So this is a linked list in C. And this is going to use an architecture that we call intrusive design. So what this means is that in Java, our linked list contained its nodes, right? The nodes were part of the linked list. In C, for an intrusive data structure, or just an intrusive data structure in general, the linked list is part of the nodes. And so let's talk about what that might mean. So let's say that I've got a struct. Let's say that, oh, I don't know, what, what shall we have a struct that represents? Let's say that we've got a struct again that represents a student. Let's say we have struct student. So here we go, struct student. And now our student is going to contain, you know, some fields, right? It might, they might have a name. Let's say we give them a char pointer for a name. Let's say we give them an int age. Now we'll store their GPA. But now let's say that I want to make a linked list of students, right? I want to make a linked list of the student object, of the student uh, structs. And so what I'm going to do now is I am going to embed pointers to the previous and next students in the list directly into the student struct. So I'm actually going to embed my linked list, 
right? The linked list components are going to be placed directly inside of the data, not inside of a linked list node class. So in essence, the data is the node for our intrusive linked list. And of course, you know, we can actually simplify this somewhat. We could actually define a struct called linked list node or, you know, something like link that would contain this previous and next pointer. However, what we are going to do for the linked list assignment is we're just going to have a macro that declares something to be an LL node. And so I'm going to have a macro called LL underscore node that we're going to pass the type struct student. And this is going to expand to those two pointers. So we'll have struct student pointer prev. and struct student pointer next. So each field that you declare containing the LL node macro will include these two members, prev and next, to refer to the previous and next nodes. And so what on earth does this linked list look like, right? Like. What is this thing? Like, what, what is this ultimately going to look like? Well, it's going to look like this. Where we're going to have a bunch of instances of struct student. All right, so this is struct student. Let me write that a little bit better so it's actually legible. Student. And the student is still going to store its name. And it's still going to store the age and the GPA, right? Every student still has these fields. But then we've got two more fields for the previous and next references. And so if we've got three of these guys in sequence, so if we have three students in sequence, Uh, that's going to go off the edge of the page. Let me move this real quick. And there we go, this will work. So if we've got three students in sequence, then they're going to be linked up like this, where this student's previous is going to be null, but the next reference is going to refer to the next student. Next student's previous will refer to this node, and so on, and so forth. And this is how an intrusive linked list works, where the nodes to our, the nodes of our list are actually just fields embedded directly inside the data. And so that is how we're going to work with linked lists in C. This has a lot of really, really big advantages. It's actually a really nice thing for us to be able to do. Firstly, because I don't have to cast anything, right? I don't have to cast anything if we do it like this. Remember how when we wrote our vector, how, you know, it was all well and good inside of this class, the interface was relatively clean. We were always just taking void pointers, allocating element size, and, you know, that was really nice. But then when we went to our test program, we went, oh no, wait, you're telling me I have to cast everything I pull out of the vector? And yes, yes you did. With an intrusive data structure, we can just keep the type as whatever is inside the list. And so we can just keep the types of the nodes as student and access student fields directly without having to cast all over the place. Uh, Prince Logic says no header file for linked list. I mean, there will be a header file Right, but that header file will be doing things like defining these macros. You know, so defining macros like LL node that let us make linked lists. 
and then defining functions, right? The public interface of the linked list still. We're still going to define the public functions that we want to be able to operate upon the linked list. And now the way that we actually access the fields that are inside of, um, the way that we can write generic functions for these intrusive data structures is also pretty cool. And so what we're going to do now is we're actually going to, for our final kind of, our final topic of the day, and it's very brief, we are going to discuss another way of writing generic data structures in C using macros. So now macros in C, all they are is macros are basically text expansion. And so let's say that I'm actually going to go back to my um, union struct or my union file here. And let's say that I'm going to hash define a macro and I'm just going to call it declare float. It's going to take a single parameter that is the name of the float I want to declare. And this macro is literally just going to expand to float name. And so every time I write declare float blah blah blah, it's going to expand to um, float name. And you can see that if we write this down here to declare fval, and we look at the expansion of this macro, then you can see that it very simply expands to float fval. We just replaced the text in the macro body with the variable that we wanted to substitute. And so that's how macros in C work. It's just text substitution. It's really pretty simple. The rules as to how the text substitution engine work is a little more complicated, but the good news is we don't need to know any of that. You can, you can make it your whole life as a C programmer without really knowing macro substitution rules. So we're not going to cover that. But what we are going to do is we are going to write a macro to access and I'm going to do this. I'll provide it to you. You don't have to write this for the assignment. But I am going to provide you with a macro to access the next field in a linked list. And the previous field in a linked list. And this macro looks something like this. So we're going to write a macro. Pound define. Linked list next. And now this macro is going to take two parameters. It's going to take a type. And a variable. And so let's see what happens when we attempt to run this macro. All right, so what we are going to do is as follows. We are going to expand this macro to, I'm writing a backslash to indicate that I want my macro to continue on the next line. Now I'm going to say that when I access LL next, I want to return a pointer to the next linked list node. And so what I am going to do is I am going to cast my variable to a pointer of the specified type. Right, so I'm going to cast my variable to a pointer of the specified type. So this is type. And then here's my variable. And now that I've casted it, regardless of what the stored type of this variable was, I can access its next field. And so this is going to allow me to access the next pointer from a linked list function, regardless of... Um, regardless of what type uh, the, the node actually is. And there are some more complexities. And again, this is, ex this is explained in the assignment description, 
But just know that when you see these big kind of capitalized identifiers, those are macros that are expanding to something kind of like this. They're expanding to field access for our linked list, and it will allow us to write generic linked lists. It's really quite cool. Um, the Linux kernel is known for using this trick extensively. Um, I mean, it's used all over the place in the Linux kernel for their generic data structures. And if you take an operating systems class, um, then you'll probably encounter these as well. They're also used in that kind of very low level operating systems programming. And we're going to use it because it makes writing a linked list easier. And so, yeah, so you'll see these intrusive data structures on the linked list project. Let me just talk about how that project is going to work very briefly. And I'm going to send out a message to uh, Twitch. In addition to, if you're one of my students, you'll see this on our discussion board. But the way that this assignment works is that I'm going to give you a GitHub repository. Um, and I'm going to ask that to do the project. And this GitHub repo is going to contain, you know, assignment or instructions as to how to run the project. It's going to contain uh, a make file, so you can just type one command to run it. It's going to include tests, so as long as all the tests pass, then your linked list is considered working. And once, so I'm going to give you a GitHub repo, and I ask that you're going to fork that GitHub repo. Make a fork of the GitHub repo into your own GitHub, uh, if you have one. I mean, assume, I'm assuming that most people have one by this point. Um, so it, you're going to make a fork of that repo into your own GitHub. Complete the assignment in your own repository. Complete your assignment in your own repository. And then once you're done with the assignment, I'm going to ask that you make a pull request back to the original repository. So a pull request in Git is basically, um, it's basically you notifying the person whose repository you fork from that you've made some changes uh, that you would like them to see. At its most simple level, that's what a pull request is. And so when you make that pull request on GitHub, it gives me the ability to leave a code review. And so I can actually review your code um, via, via GitHub. And so what I'll do is I'll read over your code, let you know if there's anything that I think you could improve as comments on the pull request, and then I'm going to deny the pull request. I don't want these actually merged back into the repository. But the code review will still be there, so you can actually go through and read uh, my comments and see if there's anything that you can do better. And so, yeah, that's how I'm going to get feedback to you on this. Note that this whole review system is actually open to anyone. So it's not just open to my students. I'm actually going to open it to anyone on Twitch as well or on YouTube if you're watching this there who would like a code review on the Linkless project. I'm more than happy to give you one. Uh, you know, as time constraints permit. Right now, I've got lots of time. And so, you know, you should, following this, you know, shortly after this recording, I've got lots of time. In the future, I may have less time, but I'm still going to try and get to everyone. So yeah, fork the repository, um, complete your project, make a pull request, I'll leave code review, and then that'll be the project done. And so yeah, so that's how that will work. And there will be instructions in the GitHub repo about how to do all of this, right? There will, there will be lots of instructions. Um, so don't worry about any of that. If anything is confusing, just read the readme and it should hopefully make sense. Prince Logic asks, will you give us a score out of 20? Yeah, so the course that, I, that I'm a TA for, uh, the data structures course, we would score all of their assignments out of 20. And I mean, I can. Um, <laughs> I can. I'm not actually going to be really checking style as much, right? Like we talk a lot about code hygiene and programming style. Um... I'm not going to be checking that as much on this as I am C idioms and your usage of memory to make sure you don't have any memory leaks and stuff like that. So, I mean, I can give you a score out of 20, but it's not going to be on the same scale as, um, as the assignments that you submitted to me for data structures. It's not going to be quite the same. But anyway, that is our lesson for today. I thank everyone who uh, turned out for this. I'm going to keep the chat open, as always, for a few minutes so that if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them, uh, whether they be about just C in general or what we talked about today or your build environment or anything like that, or you just have general questions, I'm more than happy to answer any of that. So go ahead and ask away. I'm going to get the notes uploaded so that you have access to them. 
Oh, um, Raquel Laura, you had a question on the notes for pointers. Uh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, what's your question? And I'll answer Prince Logic very briefly while you type that out. Um, did you say you'll give us the macros? Yeah, I'm going to give you the macros. Uh, you don't have to write those. You actually don't even need to know how they work. The assignment will contain very detailed instructions about how to use them and when. Oh, Raji's got a good question. Circular doubly linked list with header node or regular. I'm going to leave that one up to you. Uh, that, that's up to you. You can make it circular, you can make it non-circular. I don't particularly care. I have a particular favor for circular linked lists because I find them easier to write. But if you would like to write a non-circular linked list, go for it. The list will be doubly linked, of course, because those are more fun. Um, but yeah, you can write circular or non-circular. Okay, Raquel's got a question. You wrote a 16. Was it supposed to be an 8? Um, let me finish uploading these really fast, and then I can reference those notes for you to let you know. Let's see here. We're going to save this in this folder. Save here. This is day 6. Okay, we'll upload the notes, and then let's go ahead and switch back to today to our notes. Here we go. All right, pointer notes. Pointers, pointers, pointers. Um. Oh, oh, you're saying where I wrote that address of some pointer. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's a really good catch. That actually is supposed to say eight. Yeah, I, uh, I made a typo. Um, while we were sitting here on the stream. Yeah, so that actually is supposed to be 8. Thank you for catching that. I guess I'll now have to publish, like, an errata, uh, document <laughs> to, to indicate things that we had gotten wrong on previous days. But yeah, no, that actually is supposed to be 8. So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, the address of some pointer is 8, not 16. Uh, 16 is the address of D pointer, uh, which we didn't take. Uh, but yeah, I just at some pointer is 8. I think I just got some wires crossed there. So thank you for catching that. And now that we've made that change, I am going to now re-upload the notes. <laughs> so yeah, give me one sec. Let's go ahead and do that. With that change made. Thank you. Any other questions anyone has? Again, feel free to ask. Otherwise, just hang out for just a sec. I will get the uh, notes PDF. I'll get a link in the chat for us so that you can see that. There we go, day six. Upload that. In the meantime, we can as always listen to some lovely Bach. Uh, Today is a collection of Bach uh, preludes and fugues, which is some lovely music. The one we started the stream with is something that I'm actually learning on the organ. I've got it right back here on the organ bench, which is quite nice. Let's see, I'll make sure this is the right document. No, that's not it. Okay, here we go. Great. Let's share this. Anyone with the link can access. Here you go. So here's the notes PDF. And yeah, the Git repo for the project will be out later today. Um, if you are in my class, then um, you will see that. Um, oh, wait, let me make sure that was the right document. Oh, there are two of them now. Oh, no. It didn't replace. Um, okay, yeah, that was the right one. Great. So where's the other day six? Okay, yeah, that one can go. But anyway, yeah, so if you're in my class, um, it'll be posted to our discussion board. And if you're not, if you're just a viewer on Twitch, um, if you're following me, I think I can send you a message. Uh, I'm not fully sure about that, but I think that I can, like, blast a message out to followers on Twitch. Um... So, yeah, you may receive it that way. If I if it turns out that I can't do that, because, again, I'm pretty new to Twitch. I don't really know how most of the stuff works still. Um, then I'll figure out another way to get it to you. I might, um, I might add it. I'll add a link to the VOD uh, after this is done, definitely. And so maybe if you check back on the VOD tomorrow as well, then the link will be there for the assignment. So, yeah, that's just another way that you can get at that. Alrighty, y'all. Well, this was a fun day. I hope that everyone um, was able to learn a lot. Covered some things that are definitely kind of down in the weeds now, but interesting topics nonetheless, and I hope that everyone found them interesting. So yeah, take care. Everyone enjoy your weekend.
Um, I am going to take a Sabbath, so in other words, we are not going to have uh, a lecture tomorrow. I'm going to take tomorrow off because it turns out that trying to prepare a lecture every day and then stream it over the internet is somewhat tiring and I want a one day break, so I'm going to take a break. We'll be back on Monday at noon for our next lesson. So I will see everyone then, take care, and enjoy your weekend.